Except I'm trying to start a vicious rumor that nutrition is about nutrients, basically. Do you want to optimize your nutrition? That's the goal of Marty Kendall, an engineer taking a data-driven approach to foods. You can use this understanding to optimize your diet without becoming part of a diet tribe. Marty started out trying to help his family, as first his wife and then his son got type 1 diabetes. He believes that nutrition is about nutrients, which strangely is controversial. You're freed from addiction once your body gets the nutrients it needs from the food you eat. I've learned a lot from Marty over the years, and I believe we all can. Welcome to the Hover Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Andreas Jenfeldt. Great to have you on the show, Marty. I've been looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, uh, super cool to chat, Andreas. I would love to uh, go through uh, your backstory, and also I think you have a yep. lot of things to share that could be helpful for people listening. I know it was helpful for me. Uh, actually, four years, no, wait, six years ago, we had this uh, guy who worked in our company and he was constantly pestering me about Marty Kendall optimizing nutrition. You should look into that. And, uh, six years ago. Yeah, I mean, it took a couple of years, but then I started really, uh, initially I didn't really get it, I think, but uh, eventually, I suppose I got some things. But anyways, uh, for people who don't know Marty Kendall, um, who are you and and why are you um, so obsessed with nutrition obsessed. and food? Definitely obsessed. Are, right? Yeah, no, definitely obsessed. I'm trying to start a, a vicious rumor that nutrition is about nutrients, basically. So crazy idea. But um, yeah, I'm an engineer um, who just happened to marry well. My wife, Monica, has type 1 diabetes, and that just set me on the path of trying to understand nutrition and insulin and trying to stabilize her blood sugars and insulin levels. And when we got married, it was crazy, just you know the undulations of blood sugar and insulin. It was like, there has to be a better way. What's the solution? The hospital, the nutritionist, the doctors were no use to her up until that point. And during pregnancies, and you know, there's a real fear factor when it comes to pregnancies with elevated blood sugars and all the crazy things that can happen there. So it was a real firebrand moment to try and understand it. And then since then, that was 22 years ago, probably the last 10 years, I came across Rob Wolf and then Richard Bernstein, and um, they helped a lot. And uh, yeah, and then interestingly, I came across Jason Fung talking about the food insulin index. And I thought, I can quantify that. I can put numbers around that to try and optimize my wife's nutritional choices to stabilize the blood sugar and insulin. That worked really well. But then I realized at the same time that um, the foods with the lowest short-term insulin response are also you know, pure fat, which is nutritionally poor. So I, I joined using my engineering background um, with a multi-criteria analysis, nutrient density and insulin load to come up with a pretty good way of identifying foods that would help people with type 1 diabetes and calculating insulin and started publishing that on my blog and it just sort of blew up. I think Iver Cummins... Jason shared it with Ivor Cummins and uh, he shared it with the world and then my life changed and yeah, so got to meet a whole ton of interesting people. And then um, a couple of years ago, just when I decided to pursue the hobby full time, my son got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and my last day of work, I was basically walking out the door. The son was in the hospital on his first day taking insulin. So it's like, yeah, the, the world was telling me it was meant to be. And um, yeah, I'm really passionate about helping my son and my wife and the little monies uh, when she was 10 i imagine what if her mum had had this information how it could have changed her life for the better and there's so many people that can be helped with an agnostic data-driven approach to nutrition so that's sort of my quest to cut through the noise and help people with useful data-driven approach to nutrition so i mean i can imagine that uh, your family um having uh Having type one diabetes to, with two people in the family can can really be uh, a strong influence, of course. Uh, trying to do what you can to assist them in in their challenges with that. So how um, how has that worked? Yeah, no, um, 
my wife's last A1C was 5.2, which is better than most non-diabetics, which is great. And uh, the son is thriving, so it's like we knew what to do. And a year after he was diagnosed, he um, set a world record deadlift, you know, just feed him insulin and protein. And he just grew and uh, grew really strong and uh, deadlifted 245 kilos. And he's 18 in a couple of days. And, yeah, he's thriving. Great mate. So, uh, their life is nearly normal other than having to manage blood sugar and insulin all the time. It's not debilitated like so many people um, with type 1 are. And really type 1 is the, and it's the the canary in the coal mine or really the, the human insulin knockout model for understanding how insulin and blood sugar and nutrition work in, in people. So I get to watch all this data streaming by with their, their closed loop insulin pump systems to understand how insulin and blood sugar really work, which was different to what I'd been told by a lot of people in the social media space at the time. We all went through a interesting keto time where everybody was chasing high ketones and more fat, and I got caught up with that, and um, the data didn't support all of it. So, yeah. I mean, we'll talk about that because, uh, of course, a lot of people – still believe that uh, low carbon keto is the way to go for type one and and to some extent that might yeah. be true right but maybe yeah. not 100 percent. yeah i mean for type one a lower carb protein focused diet a la richard bernstein who is incredible he has had type one since he was 10 thriving at 86 and he was an engineer come doctor who you know everything he's said has really proved to be correct but it, it's really a, a focus on protein fueling from fat not a focus on fat and avoiding protein to get high ketones and minimize your insulin is the the thing that i learned and i think that that's the same for everybody in it and insulin is the bigger you are the more insulin is required to hold your energy and storage was the big aha moment for me that the majority of your insulin is basal insulin so the bigger you are the more insulin your pancreas is trying to pump out and that little bit of insulin after you eat is only like 10, 30, 40% of your daily insulin requirements. So to really manage your insulin, it's about finding a way to eat that allows you to not be overweight and insulin resistant. So the, the, the satiety is what I came to as the focus to say for most people to reduce insulin, they need to eat in a way that helps them to eat less over the long term. Exactly. You can think you, maybe you've had two epiphanies in a way, because I mean, there is also there is the conventional wisdom, if you will, um, just eat your carbs and cover with insulin, mm. um, or or whatever uh, it is for 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 most people in the world, and then then you have this low carb approach, uh, mm. a very keto focused approach. Uh, which is in some ways uh, a huge improvement, I suppose. Uh, mm. In some ways, maybe not, not, not strictly necessary. And, and then, then we have sort of the next level, which is what you've been doing, and, and it's very mm. similar, I think, to the evolution that uh, I've had and and what we're doing mm. with Hava, mm. um, trying to take it to an agnostic sort of next level that isn't yeah. uh, strictly tied to uh, just focusing on on carbs and insulin. That's just part of it sort of mm. so uh want to take the listener through that journey from being sort of uh, knowing what most people know about nutrition and then then going into low carb and then maybe to something a little bit more evolved even yeah um i suppose a low carb approach is amazing especially for people with diabetes who are on that blood sugar insulin roller coaster and that is the bane of someone with type one's life is that they always have a high glucose. They have to jam in a ton of insulin that comes crashing down. So lowering your carbs to stabilize that is really good. Um, if you're on a low carb diet, your blood sugars are already quite stable though. And then uh, like Bernstein has always been very protein focused, but then along came Jimmy Moore trying to interpret the work of Steve Finney and we're all chasing elevated ketones because ketones were 
this magical thing. And it really, I think ketones are great in the context of an energy deficit where they're coming from your body fat. But if you're just loading in more and more fat to get high and higher blood ketones, you, you're just going to, your body can still store that fat on your body. It, it only requires a little bit of insulin, but it still gets stored. And the more fat you store, the more insulin resistant you become. And it's not what we're all trying to achieve to be metabolically healthy, lean, strong, uh, and have a long, high quality life. So, um, yeah, stabilizing your blood sugars is, is really good, but they don't need to be flatline and just switching all carbs for and protein for fat is, is probably what a lot of us got caught up in the uh, misguided understanding and, and the focus on getting higher ketones by any means possible. So what are you talking about, like 2017, 18, that kind of time or? When yeah, was... yeah. Um, 2014, um, uh, Jimmy Moore's book came out and I read that voraciously and started testing my ketones. And I think a lot of people started saying, well, ketones are magic. We've just got to drink bulletproof coffee. And I was hoeing down on the butter and trying to test my ketones and then what happens eventually is your body adapts to that keto phase and your ketones lower and you go, what do I do? I need to eat more fat to keep my ketones up to be healthy. And even in the Verda trials, you see after a number of weeks and months and, and two years, the, the ketones are back to 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So on the most ketogenic, well-supervised ketogenic diet, these guys are having negligible ketones because your body adapts and ketones are great if they're coming from your stored body fat but if you're chasing elevated ketones with more dietary fat it's um probably not the right recipe for maximal yeah. health or I mean, nutrition I, I think most people have moved on from that uh, do you think uh, there still are people who need to hear that message out there um some some i mean twitter's a crazy place and every time i go there i you know find some long chat with somebody who says you know fat's the most satiating nutrient and um, yeah yeah i mean it's moved on a little bit to moved on a little bit to carnivore i think now i mean the the yeah. sort of trend has moved on from keto and ketones to carnivore and high fat meats Mm. is that yeah would you say that's true potentially a lot of people have moved on you know if low carb is good zero carb must be better and there's a lot of benefits from carnivore i think sean's a great guy and um had some great chats with him Absolutely. he's quite rational a lot of things um i agree but i think the magic of that a lot of the time is just getting plenty of bioavailable protein mm. and um you're avoiding all the processed junk with refined grain sugars and seed oils that is just the, the 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 mainstay of our ultra profitable ultra palatable modern diet right so the so carnivore or zero carb is is one way to escape if you will from the ultra processed yeah. food environment and it yeah. can work well for people who manage to eat that, like that maybe a bit mm. challenging for most to do yeah. for a lifetime though i suppose Potentially, potentially. Um, a lot of people thrive, especially if they've got gut issues and autoimmune issues. It just removes a lot of the inflammatory things that, that mess us up. But um, yeah, like you say, not everybody wants to go carnivore and that's great if you want to. But um, yeah, maybe there's another way that doesn't only rely on protein leverage. Um, it's more complex than that. Right, so let's move into the complexity then, because you, you kind of moved on, and like I, like I said, uh, you you were arguing about this uh, quite a few years ago, like six years ago, I mm. know at least, and and I, I guess you started your blog, optimizing nutrition, even a few years before that. Um, but you were certainly before me to uh, escape from keto land, if you will, <laughs> or or I mean, not that that is not that is a bad thing, but uh, but uh, seeing that there are there are more ways to mm. get to the goal so yeah. can you take us through your evolution like uh, you were like you said you were reading these keto books uh, 10 years ago and really in getting into it and then and then you realized that that's perhaps not the optimal way to do things so what what is optimal 
Yeah, I suppose it, it depends on your context and preferences and goals, and that's really important. And if your goal is therapeutic ketosis because you've got neurological issues and epilepsy and you're a, you're a kid with epilepsy and, and the high-fat keto diet works for you, then that's that's a great application or Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer, you know, it's a, it's an evolving space that's totally fascinating. But if you're not in that situation, I think 98% of people who are interested in keto are probably in it for the, the weight loss and metabolic health benefits. And getting out of the the hyperpalatable fat plus carb danger zone, that's sort of the what I've come up with more recently is the bliss points. And we know from the work of Howie Moskowitz in the 60s, he designed army rations and then went on to identify fat, sugar, salt, these perfect bliss points that became the foundation of ultra-processed food. The, the data shows that the sort of a bliss point of 47% carbs, 37% fat and 12% protein and most ultra processed foods hit those bliss points and we just can't stop eating them. So if if we move either direction away from that, we're gonna eat less and be more satiated. So um yeah, um so so to go back, like if 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 you want to stabilize your blood sugar, low carb is great. But the magic of satiety comes from the protein um and getting away from that hyperpalatable bliss point zone of fat and carbs together with just enough nutrients to seduce you to think that that food may contain enough nutrients to support you but you have to keep eating a ton of them to get it there's like it's just flirting with your appetite but it doesn't contain enough nutrients to really satisfy you whether that be protein minerals or vitamins as you're arguing that uh, modern ultra processed foods and and many of the foods around us are just too low in nutrients, too low in protein, for, of course, but also you're big on on the micronutrients, the mm. vitamins, the minerals, and that mm. uh, if the food we eat is just full of uh, refined carbs, sugar, and added fats, then mm. we're going to have to eat much more in order mm. to get the nutrition we need. That's the protein leverage hypothesis, basically, but uh, you're sort of adding the micros on top of that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to start the nutrient leverage hypothesis that it's not just protein we eat to get protein, but also minerals and, and vitamins. I mean, that's a, a whole different uh, argument that would be interesting <laughs> to get into maybe later, but uh, you know, how much of this comes automatically if you're, if you're eating enough high protein mm. real foods will all the micronutrients generally come along for the ride sort of they, they to generally some degree, come yeah. packaged together to some degree but you can finesse it and you know optimizing nutrition i'm always going how do we take it to that nth degree and use numbers to help people get directly to the goal that they want to go to so yeah i, I suppose to go back to your previous question it was like well, what's your context a lot of people want some weight loss they want to they want to you know feel good they want to look good they want muscle they want less fat so prioritizing protein that comes with the nutrients moving from that 47 percent carb to about 20 percent carb gets you a, a massive satiety benefit and at that point if you're not making progress then dialing back the dietary fat while prioritizing protein just all makes sense and that was sort of what i was on about five years ago with half a million days of my fitness pal data i dove into that and um you know found the the key and the you know the, the the formula for satiety back then and started trying to scream it on social media and more recently it's like let's look at the the minerals and potassium sodium calcium iron even vitamin c seem to have a a beneficial you know they're the signature of the foods that help us to eat less and feel more satiated yeah, certainly the signature but then uh, you get into this whole uh, correlation and causation thing and yeah. You know, are things uh, correlated? Uh, if you eat high protein foods, they contain these things too. Then mm. it starts looking mm. in the observational data like all of it is causing obesity. Maybe it's just the protein, or uh, maybe it's yeah. a little bit of everything. It's hard to tease that from the data, right? Um, I mean, you and I have these fun chats where you 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 play devil's advocate, and I go, well, um, I think with sodium is a really good example that it's well recognized we've got a craving for sodium so if you don't get enough sodium 
you enjoy salty foods. They you, you crave them and you eat more of them. But once we get enough sodium, the really salty foods taste too salty and we eat less. So there's sort of a understanding with sodium that nutrient poor foods taste bland, really salty foods, nutrient rich foods taste have a stronger taste that sort of puts a break on our appetite and said you only need a little bit of this to get the sodium you need but we seem to see the same thing in the data with i've got 316,000 days of data, micronutrient data from our optimizers who use nutrient optimizer and the enhanced survey smash them together to get a, a broad spectrum of data and yeah you see that <sighs> that bliss point with all the nutrients that we seem to eat until we get enough of each nutrient but once we pack more nutrients into our energy budget we eat less so you know you want to get more than the minimum the minimum the rdas that we all strive to get and often struggle to get in our modern diet is just the typically very close to the bliss point that aligns with maximum intake but there's also this thing that uh, I mean, uh, maybe there is a case to be made that uh, we eat to get a certain amount of of sodium, but that mm. that should be pretty easy in today's food environment to get enough sodium. You could argue, at least yeah. uh, ultra processed foods are often definitely full of sodium because there is also this hedonic, this sort of hyper palatable effect. If you combine salt with high fat foods or high carb foods, then they become even more yeah. palatable you eat more like salted nuts you eat more than unsalted yeah. nuts for example right and, and all the people walking around trying to minimize their sodium when they come across a bag of chips with a lot of sodium with fat and carbs together at the same time it's just this is blowing up my brain and i just can't stop eating it because you're getting the energy and the sodium and you definitely have a conscious taste for sodium robin homer and simpson said we've got five appetites um protein fat carbs sodium calcium and there may be others that we don't yeah. understand yet and that's been my you know what are the others and yeah but this is of course controversial because you have all these arguments that uh, eating more salt uh, raises your blood uh, pressure and and mm. uh, probably leads to more strokes more heart disease uh, in mm. the long term which at least for people with metabolic syndrome, that seems to check out. Right? Mm. That seems to be true. Mm. Sure. Uh, sure. Arguably, it's so less you only need a certain amount of the sodium, and then you move yeah. on to the other nutrients that are limiting in your diet. But it's still an interesting uh, uh, thing. Let's say you don't have metabolic problems, you don't have obesity, you don't have high blood pressure, then then eating more salt might not be such a bad thing. And what you're saying is that if you get enough salt from sort of a benign sources maybe you salt your real food based meals or whatever yep. then you will be less inclined to overeat on yeah or at least less inclined to fall for uh, sort of yeah ultra processed uh, potato chips or, or salted yep. nuts or whatever exactly exactly and, and then once you've got enough sodium your body goes well do i have enough protein do i have enough calcium do i have enough potassium do i have enough iron and Although we can't, we don't have the same conscious taste for those nutrients. It just, you know, it seems that the data indicates that we crave those or, you know, on the flip side, if you don't believe that we crave those subconsciously or that we've got a learned appetite for it, those, those nutrients um, are statistically significantly correlated with eating less. And, and they're also the nutrients that have, declined in our food system that we haven't replaced with fortification we've fortified the hell out of our food with all these synthetic vitamins and a, and a bit of iron filings in our cornflakes and we can brag that nutrigrain is a great source of iron because we threw some iron <laughs> filings in there because we put but, it in there in the ultra process mix yeah yeah and that that just potentially just it's not to help our health it's just enough so that the nutrigrain and cocoa pops we don't get bored of them and go and go chasing the steak and seafood that contain those nutrients naturally. So, you know, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you can get away with living on um, cereals. Uh, you don't get cravings for steak in the same way. 
if you uh, potentially if you potentially spice yeah. them up with uh, additives and stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I mean, the, the the difference between you and me, I think we have a lot of similarities, and, and I'm very inspired by by your work for sure, and I know Ted is too. Um, I guess the difference is you. Uh, it's in the name, kind of. You try to optimize uh, nutrition based on data, really going into the weeds. And we're trying to do the opposite approach, you might say, with uh, simplicity. We want to make it simple. We want to make it very, very simple for people to take advantage of the the twenty percent of the effort that gives eighty percent of the results. Sort of, um, you're kind of pushing towards hundred. Uh, we're trying to make yeah, it super yeah, yeah. simple to get uh, get eighty percent. I'm I'm completely fascinated by the detail and and the different moving parts in nutrition and how we can. I think if you know, I'm just finalizing a paper to hopefully give to Robin Hunter and Simpson or somebody like that to publish with me. That it would be my dream, and that that would a nutrient focused approach to nutrition would blow up the current system that is all about fearing cholesterol or saturated fat or seed oils or oxalates or sodium or you know you name it there's plants animals you know it, who whatever your camp is you demonize the other camp based on some bad nutrient but if you just focus on getting the nutrients you need from the food you eat whether you you know no matter what where you live what your budget is what your religious convictions are what your ethical convictions are if you've prioritized nutrients you're going to improve your diet just you know again just trying to start a rumor that nutrition is about getting enough nutrients so yeah and but the really cool thing is that once when we've talked a lot and compared our systems mine takes a different approach taking into account you know protein calcium fiber potassium iron they come up with a very similar um outcome to what ted has come up with from a research-based approach so it's really cool i think that um the, the two different perspectives align really nicely with a, a, a similar approach to satiety yeah exactly it's fascinating uh starting from slightly different starting points but coming to very very similar results i think that uh that speaks uh, to the just how how close to correct this might be this yeah. tight approach. And, and you guys say once we get more studies and and data from Harvard, you keep on refining. It. I think it's of pretty course. darn close. Yeah. I mean, and the, I, I, the idea is just to be as close as we can now, and then keep getting yeah. closer over time as we get better research, as we get better data. Yeah, but I, as but I, I, get, I think I, it's already already very very promising. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that you know I've got eight hundred thousand days of data in my spreadsheet that I can correlate different nutrient intakes with calorie intake. But as I get you know, a couple of million, I'll rerun the analysis and uh, you know keep refining it. But I've been obsessively doing this for a while, and it doesn't change. So um, I think we're getting from two different perspectives a, a similar landing place. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of it like, uh, in a way, like the Google algorithm of uh, 1998 mm. or something. Uh, pretty damn good, uh, by far better than anything else uh, currently available. But uh, of course, uh, not as refined or effective as, uh, or, or you know, uh, as good as at, at all sort of exceptions and, and, and details as, as it is today. Mm. You just keep mm. refining it with more data and more, more evidence and uh, it can become better. Mm. Um, okay, so I mean, I, I think we should uh, explore this because uh, a lot of people still believe that low carb is the way to go, uh, or carnivore is the way to go. Um, high fat carnivore is the way to go for everybody. I mean, we both agree that this is an approach that can work really well for a lot of people. Uh, we probably also agree that uh, the the way that this is commonly explained in this uh this part of the world uh uh focusing on carbs and insulin um mm. primarily maybe uh not the full truth at least um yeah. so i mean you wrote a book and you you put a pretty inflammatory title on it even <laughs> you want to say what it's called uh, yeah, my uh, my business partner Alex uh, decided to call it "Big Fat Keto Lies," and it's gone really well on Amazon and still in the charts after a year. 
on on Kindle. So yeah, it's had a lot of good responses. So it's exciting. I mean, it's a good book. I would I would uh, dispute uh, the last word in the title, though. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Generally speaking, this is not people lying. This is people believing very strongly in in what they're saying. But maybe mm. uh, it sells better that way. And uh, but maybe misconceptions or mistakes uh, could be more yeah. fair. What do you yeah. think? Oh yeah, I I see. You know, Martin Luther nailed his ninety nine theses to the wall of the the church in Denmark or whatever it was. That was sort of my. You know, this is my. I sort of love low carb and low carb community has given us so much and we um, have so much to be grateful for. But I think there were so many things that were believed in the heyday of the explosion of keto and it became, it came to mean so many things to so many different people and there were so many different beliefs. And I think, as you said, misconceptions. And when I looked at the data and looked at the nutrient density and in insulin, um, yeah, there was a lot of things that didn't stand up. So I thought, let's put this out there, mm. um, start some discussion. And, um, yeah, the, the big one is like, uh, before gain... you, before you start, oh, I just want to say that, uh, of course, uh, this sort of uh, is a reaction to this, uh, keto, uh, hype of, you know, quite a few years ago, but there is similar, uh, thought patterns today like we talked about with uh, high fat uh, carnivore diets and, and how people mm. explain the um, why they work. And, and these explanations may may actually be hurting people in the way that yeah. they don't necessarily get the results that they are hoping for. Uh, they may be struggling unnecessarily. They could get better results or uh, they may be able to eat uh, a more flexible, more sort of mm. socially easier uh, diet with mm. no, uh, no ill effects uh, mm. so that you know if people really see a more correct way of explaining this it can have two mm. benefits it can lead to more flexibility more delicious foods to eat and, and also more of the health effects and body composition effects and weight loss effects that that people mm. are looking for so i think it's important no, and I would, we'd love for us to go through these key mistakes that uh, and also in a way that it doesn't just target the sort of keto movement of 2015, but but uh, mm. maybe even more so uh, the thoughts that are out there, the theories that are out there today in, in a high fat uh, a carnivore approach or um, or anything uh, like that. Or, or yeah, sort of was... an old school low carb, I suppose, as well, which mm. never really went away. Yeah, I think a lot of people saw that when type two and type one diabetics get insulin, they get fatter um, when they start injecting insulin. And that is a reality, but that is because it's exogenous insulin. You're injecting insulin, which forces your body to hold back the energy and storage and often makes your blood sugar crash. And you want to eat sooner. You want to eat junkier food because your blood sugars have fallen through the floor and your body is your appetite is upregulated to make you get more energy now and it doesn't matter you're not going to go for the steak and broccoli at that point you're going to be going for the doritos and the oreos um but that's true with exogenous insulin but in a natural environment you're in an evolutionary environment your your, your body doesn't produce more of anything than it needs to it it's highly conserves everything so your pancreas doesn't produce any more insulin than is required to hold all that energy back in storage while you keep eating the low satiety nutrient poor food. And that was sort of a bit of a revelation to me that I thought, you know, if I just eat a lot of fat and drink the olive oil and bulletproof coffee and the, the um, coconut oil that was magic to get my ketones up, I could switch off my pancreas like my wife and my son now. But you can't switch off your pancreas. Your pancreas always produces just enough insulin to to store that excess energy you're eating. So the real solution to lower your insulin is to, you know, lowering carbs is a great start to stabilize your blood sugar tick. All for that getting down from 47 to 20% carbs gives you a massive benefit. But then the next step is to prioritize satiety. And, and the key factor of that is prioritizing protein and, and dialing back the dietary fat to allow your body to use the stored body fat on your body. So, uh, yeah, I think that 
understanding could help a lot of people and it's it's still a massive aha when anybody in a macros masterclass from a keto background starts tracking their food they go wow i didn't realize how much energy i'm getting from all the added oils and my salad and i thought this is a free food and it's really hard to undo those habits once you've believed that fat's a free food yeah i mean i i can say the same thing uh i mean i've been uh, in the low carb camp since uh you know way more than 20 years ago i guess uh, mm. um yeah 22 or something um and i used to believe those things i used to believe that fat was pretty much a free food i used to have heavy whipping cream in my coffee mm. quite a lot actually and then i remember when i stopped just stopped that because i drink a lot of coffee maybe more than i should um just stopping that i i lost uh, uh, several pounds just like that wow. by by not having heavy cream in my coffee um but it, i mean it added up to a lot uh yeah. i mean an insane amount of calories i mean phew, might have had i don't know 500 calories or more every day just from just from that so it made a huge difference really maybe even way more than that um and i i think now that uh, i track what i eat with the hava app uh i see the same things like if you prioritize higher protein items you you try to go a little bit uh, more carefully with a uh, high fat ingredients not not to remove it completely you can still have olive oil on your foods etc but not as much mm. it it really makes a huge huge difference to the scoring and uh, I, I think it's it's quite visible in the effects it's how it has as well i just lean out way more when i think like that and uh, 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 depending on your goals um, that may or may not be a, a, a great thing. Maybe if you want uh, uh, maintenance and you want your food to be as delicious as possible, then you should have a little bit more added fats. Uh, but if you want to be quite lean, mm. then you should really look into that, I think. And, and, and again, back to how people struggle with this today. I think a lot of people, when they go low-carb or carnivore today, there's a lot of talk about... Uh, Still, I, I hear from some people like you. You should, you should go on a high fat version of it to lose weight, and that seems to be. Well, what would you say about that? Uh, I think that, like, if you look at a, a sirloin steak, it's like sixty five percent protein, so it's going to be hard to live on sirloin steak alone because your body's going to be craving some energy. So, adding a bit of fat, at least initially, can be helpful to make it sustainable and delicious. And you go, oh, okay, I don't. Don't miss the junk food because I've got fatty steak and I'm adding a bit of butter to it. But once things plateau, um, dialing back the added fat is sort of the next step and getting your protein percentage up. And lower carb, as I mentioned before, going from 47 to 20% carb has a big satiety benefit. But if you're low carb, you need to get your energy from somewhere. So sort of that 50, 50 to 60% fat with a low carb diet is sort of the sweet spot. It gets you out of the, the fat plus carb danger zone. Um, if you've got plenty of protein, you're gonna be very satiated. So it's not a not a low fat diet. I suppose that's the misconception. You know, uh -huh. What is low fat? What is high fat? You know, low fat is less than 20%. And if your carbs are low, you're gonna be mainly fueling from fat, but you're not yes. shooting for 80% fat. You're down at 50 to 60% fat. If you really want to get shredded, you might want to dial it down even more. But, you know, most people aren't looking to get on the on stage in the speedos in the next couple of weeks. So uh -huh. they don't need to go that go to that extreme. No, but that, that's a very good point you're making um, that uh, uh, some people may be feeling, hey, what was this? A low fat diet that uh, right. that didn't seem to work so well for me back in the 80s or whenever, whenever it was. Mm. Uh, but like you said, low fat, maybe that's 30 percent or 20 percent fat here we're talking mm. 50 60 it's yeah. still not even yeah. remotely close to that you are fueling yourself from fat you just but, but we're all aiming just for not overdoing 80. It. we're going for 80 to get our ketones elevated because that was magic back in 2014 but it's yeah. you know not 80 maybe 50 60 if your carbs are low and your proteins up there okay so that the uh, the first uh misconception is about uh the protein fat mix and and about insulin sort of uh hmm. being a the, like the baseline insulin is really 
guided by the amount of fat stores you have more than mm. anything else. And yeah. uh, and to get that down, you need to potentially eat less added fats also. And then the baseline mm. insulin goes down and, you know, together with your, your body weight. And mm. yeah, so then you're lower weight and lower insulin. Um, and it wasn't about carbs. Uh, I mean, the carbs were, were not the problem there. You already took care of that. You had another problem to take care of. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, and really the carbs, problem of carbs is just that we're combining fat and carbs in this perfect mix that overdrives dopamine and we all gravitate to those foods naturally because they allow us to prepare for winter and store fat, but a winter never comes. So, you know, our food system knows how to design that perfect fat-carb combo. So lowering carbs just gets us away from that bliss point zone. Mm. You lower carbs, you get more protein, and you also mm. get away from all the hyperpalatable ultra processed foods, and you know all the ice creams and donuts disappear, um, and many, many, many other less obvious things too. Mm. Uh, so, what else? You you had a number of them. What, what else would you yeah. say is a big misconception that uh, people still struggle with? The other big one for me um, that I focused a lot on lately is the you know fasting for longer is better and then refeed on high fat keto. And I just saw a lot of people not eating for days and weeks. And, you know, I tried it myself for quite a while and you get to the point where you lose touch with your appetite and your hunger signals. And then when you eat again, you just can't stop eating. And without enough protein, without enough nutrients, when you refeed, you're, uh, you're going to lose muscle mass. Your metabolic health is going to worsen. Probably your body composition is going to, worse than you may be lighter for a little while but then uh, how long can you sustain that for so um looking at the blood sugar data just streaming across my screen all the time it was like we, well we can use our glucose as a fuel gauge um so my wife when blood sugar is really high it's a, a bad time to eat because they're just going to go higher but when the glu glucose is low it's a good time to eat. And I thought, well, uh, there was some interesting work looking at using um, uh, hunger training, using glucose and devised a system called data-driven fasting just to help people not to fast as long, but to give them a, a really clear indication using a simple glucometer exactly when they need to eat and refuel and understand their hunger. And, you know, they're eating two and three times a day while losing weight. And getting the protein they need and yeah it's just without tracking their food they can learn a lot from that glucose data which is yeah it's a lot of people loved it and that's what changed my life enabled me to give this thing a go as a, as a full-time hobby interesting so fasting definitely also was a huge trend i guess in some extent mm. to some extent it still is uh, intermittent fasting but uh, mm. uh i think a lot of people when i listen to people online just like you and tad and and, and me too we kind of lot of, lost a little bit of faith in this idea of of longer term fastings or i mean mm. uh fasts um not that i was ever really into that uh personally but it seems like a little goes a long way and um uh, yeah and probably the quality of the food that you eat when you do it is still yeah. by far number one yeah even if you don't eat for a week you still need the nutrients for that week so you know if you're going to be losing lean muscle mass and your body needs the sodium and potassium and calcium and everything else and if you're not giving your body that regularly um yeah it's not going to work out in in the long run you may get some short-term results but i just you know in our challenges and the data-driven fasting challenge there's so many people tried and tried and tried especially the the postmenopausal female they're doing keto and fasting and trying harder and harder but, but stalling out or, or making worse progress so just using the glucose as a guide just helps them they go well okay my, my blood sugar raised a lot after that donut or the the mocha coffee or you know that thing i knew i shouldn't eat i'll eliminate those but then the next step is using a glucose to guide when you eat and if you're loading in a ton of fat it doesn't raise your blood sugar a lot but you end up waiting a long time to get below your glucose trigger again when you can eat again so yeah it's a really just using your glucose and making observations from that gives you a lot of insight into exactly when and what to eat and people improve how they eat without 
having to track their food and then if they want to dial it in further they can and they realize that prioritizing protein and nutrients and dialing back the fat and carbs a little bit allows them to make great progress towards better metabolic health hmm. okay uh moving on to uh, should we go through one or two more what what other things uh, what other misconceptions uh, do you st- think that people still struggle with that they yeah, could get the, benefits from the, uh, just the really fat as a that as a free food because it doesn't raise insulin I, I believe that for a little while and uh, I just blew up eating excess fat like a lot of people did I think and I looked in the mirror and went maybe maybe it's not working out for me and it's not what I believe so yeah that's what motivated me to dive into the satiety aspect um, so fat's not the free food because it can still uh, be stored and that can still yeah. raise your baseline insulin and then you are more insulin resistant and your insulin is higher the whole day so it's not a good exactly just because you don't get an insulin spike initially Mm. it's not a you're not home free because the problem comes long term Mm. instead yeah and um professor roy taylor's work is completely fascinating that was a real um understanding the personal fat threshold and that really diabetes type 2 diabetes is a matter of the energy backing up in our system so when our fat stores are full the, the all that energy backs up into our bloodstream and we measure elevated glucose but we've also got elevated fat in our blood because we've got excess fat in our body but if we can dial back the fat in our body then the all the energy that we eat from our diet just automatically goes into storage easily and and doesn't back up in our system so again the focus is let's find a way that enables us to increase satiety and not eat as much in a sustainable way that we enjoy so yeah i think the um i'm just thinking you're talking before that the great thing about the satiety framework is low carb works really well because of protein leverage and focusing on protein but it just you don't have to go carnivore or low carb to get the same effect. Maybe I think a lower carb diet that's protein focused is probably the most nutrient dense approach and, and um, ideal or, or more optimal. But if for whatever reason you prefer plant based or um, a, a higher carb, lower fat diet, then the satiety framework still works. So you don't have to subscribe to a particular dietary paradigm or named diet. You can use this understanding to optimize your diet without becoming part of a diet tribe or you know joining a community that all has a strict set of rules it's just like what are the common factors that give us the nutrients we need that satisfy our appetite yeah i like it uh sort of an agnostic uh, Mm. first principles based approach just looking at the data looking at the evidence looking at the science and saying sort of what what are the core underlying themes here what are the factors that govern this mm. because another another approach uh, that's very very popular in in the mainstream media today is uh, focusing on ultra processed foods um, mm. ultra processed foods are the devil and uh, if you avoid them then things will be fine which is probably true uh, that uh, they are uh, as a group uh, on average they are awful uh, lots of data to prove that but um Maybe the problem is that the definition is so unclear mm. and so fussy, and you can have foods that are unprocessed that may not be great, yeah. and you can have ultra processed foods that actually are great. So there are lots of exceptions. Like a, mm. statistically, on average, sure, yeah. But it's kind of like low carb or keto, where mm. you know, on average, yeah, it's good, but there are lots of exceptions here, or or plant based diets same thing kind of mm. yeah on average if you eat a real foods based uh, whole f- whole foods plant-based diet then mm. yeah that's probably a huge improvement from from the standard american diet yes but there are lots of exceptions mm. with, with and every ultra foods. processed food is typically plant-based because it's more profitable to make those formulated foods um, from sugar flour and and refined seed oils with flavors colors and a few synthetic vitamins thrown in so you can brag on the packet that's a great source of all these nutrients but um, yeah i fully agree ultra processed food i think is useful and the ultra processed people book is a fantastic insight about how a food system is just designed for profit 
to extract money from you at the expense of our health and make us feel addicted to these foods. But the formula that they use is, you know, we've reverse engineered that to create the satiety formula to help people escape from that. So if you're prioritizing protein and minerals and vitamins that come naturally in food, then you're going to escape that and you don't have to subscribe to, you know, I'm, I'm only eating, you know, Nova class three and not let Nova class four and having to understand all that minutiae and is protein powder, uh, is my protein powder that contains this ingredient, a uh, ultra processed food and I should avoid it. You know, it's just a, you avoid all that and just go, what foods contain nutrients and promote satiety. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, some people may be interested, uh, what foods do you eat? And uh, when we score it, we do our satiety scoring using the Hava system. Where where do you land? <laughs> yeah, um, I suppose when, when you start tracking things, you always try a little bit harder. But uh, most days I'll start the day with some Greek yogurt with some protein powder mixed in. And then the wife is amazing and makes me some salads that I throw some eggs and canned fish in for lunch. And then she makes an amazing dinner that's typically something amazing and low carb so that's pretty much what i eat and i'll use some protein powder as a snack occasionally and i'll probably sit at 40 ish percent protein and on the harva app maybe 50 to 60 so yeah but uh, i'm always since i met ted and believed what ted was on about with protein to energy ratio it's like let's try prioritizing this protein thing and it's yeah definitely benefited me and uh yeah ted and i've been on a similar journey for a while and learn a lot together both grew up in an sda church environment and uh, understand the What's SDA? intricacies oh seventh day adventist so um and they you know, their belief system about food has heavily influenced our international um under nutritional guidelines and the fear of different nutrients and meat and salt and and the like. So, it's very uh, veg vegetarian approach, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 it's very central to the um, uh, the blue zone concept. And blue zones is actually owned by the Seventh Day Adventist Church. So there's an interesting confluence of you, know, you might call it conspiracy, but you know the the ethical vegans and the Seventh Adventist Church and and uh, an environmental approach and big food trying to maximize profit that all sort of align to um, guide you to a, a plant-based diet that's ultra processed and ultra profitable. So I, I think you need to take a lot of that with a grain of salt. And if you look at it through the eyes of does it provide the nutrients my body needs in, in the amounts that I need them, does it provide satiety? You cut through a lot of that confusion, and, and, and the things that promote longevity are you know, not being obese, not being overweight, along with all the other great things of having a great social environment and being active and exercising the like. But when it comes to food, it's you know satiety and, and, and not being diabetic and, and overweight. Yeah, that's a, that's a great starting point because we know that. Uh being uh, overweight and having type 2 diabetes and, and metabolic problems really accelerates aging in a way mm. um like it, it really drives these top chronic diseases heart disease mm. many cancers mm. alzheimer's etc so it kind of accelerates aging in a way towards all the top causes of death mm. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and, and might do so by 10 or 20 years i guess if you are mm. really very metabolically you know, on the non-beneficial side of that scale. Yeah, yeah. It's but I, I think it's interesting. Yes, oh, I was just going to say it's a crazy world out there of the all the different people trying to influence you and educate you about how to eat. When a lot of the time it's a, a profit motive to get you to buy more of their ultra-processed products, which are largely plant-based. Yeah, I heard some some uh, quote from someone I forgot who, but. Uh, like all men have uh, two reasons for what they do. One that sounds great and, and then the true reason. Yeah. And we don't always understand what our appetite is doing and why we're craving different things. We make up reasons for why we do what we do. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting also because you talk about diet religions and there are many, of course, uh, every every sort of uh, 
that a tribe is a is in a, in a way uh, has some some religious sort of connotations there. But it's interesting when when you have a a, a diet approach that actually is promoted by a, a real religion, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a lot of real church. It's not even uh, it's not even like a church. It, it is a church. Yeah, and the SDAs are a bunch of really lovely people, well-meaning, but they um, they've got some interesting beliefs about evangelizing that way of eating to the world and uh, have been aggressively promoting it th since the the forties and fifties. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure they, they uh, do a lot of uh, good things and uh, hopefully hmm. the diet that they promote is mostly beneficial. Although I, I do think there are some dangers to that and, and, and that it's, it's much more beneficial, I think for a lot of people to leave those different diet camps, like you say, these name diets, it's not necessary. Uh, you could take a science-based approach instead based on the factors that are most evidence-based and then pick and choose what fits you and your life. And uh, you can make it plant-based or animal-based or anything in between for most people, I suppose. And yeah. then uh, uh, you can make it uh, uh, low-carb or not so low-carb, um, low-fat or not so low-fat. Um, you can you can go the way that fits you, but you can still, I think, with uh, either either learn all these things and, and do it on your own, or leverage tools such as what we're building to try to make it simple to to get into this and see where you are and and optimizing where you are and or the things that you are building. I and mean, we're collaborating on some things too. So mm, that's, that's pretty inter interesting. And and what you said there about. Uh, um, you know, being in the 50 to 60 range on satiety, I think it's interesting because that seems to be where most people who really care about what they're eating and, and have good results, they tend to end up somewhere around there, even mm. if they take uh, pretty different, different approaches. Like around 50 is a good uh, maintenance place for a lot of people. And then if you go, if you really want to push it, you could go to 60 or slightly above and then you're going to almost certainly eat quite a bit less and still yeah. get the nutrition you need and and lean out. Mm. I think that that's what happens to me. And I, that's what I hear from people who are using it too. Yeah. yeah, And that's what we see in all our programs that when they focus on satiety, high satiety foods, you go, I'm just, I'm just full. And you know, once you focus on satiety, you don't have to worry about limiting and restriction. It's about how do I get, how do I, if I jam more, of the good things in my diet i don't have to it's not a mindset of restriction and deprivation it's how do i nourish my body so it can thrive and when it comes to longevity um, professor bruce ames has got the um, nutrient triage theory that he says you know if you give your body the nutrients it needs it can focus on the long-term um, activities for thriving in the in the long term and longevity but if you only give it a minimal amount of nutrients it just goes well how can i survive in the short term and you, you neglect those long-term benefits so that's another reason i'm sold out to protein and nutrients and you know, making nutrition about nutrients so yeah we've got a better yeah, it's, chance it's of... quite nice uh, to get away from this deprivation mindset where you have to restrict and eat less and instead take the opposite approach in a sense mm. like you said try to eat more more satiating mm. foods, more That's of all these thing. foods, more yeah. of the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, That's the goal. Uh, and then you can eat as much or as little as you want as yeah. long as you focus on, on eating more of the good stuff. Yeah, and, and the people with the uh, high satiety diets, most nutrient-dense diets, you know, challenges have got a, a blend of, you know, it looks like a ton of vegetables a lot of the time, but it's the, the energy and protein are coming from the meat and seafood. So it's really just everything but ultra processed foods made for maximum profit and that's what everybody out there wants you to buy and there's so much confusion out there about food and if we're confused we'll just keep buying the easiest cheapest and uh most hyper palatable thing that will soothe our emotions and give us a dopamine hit but if you just say well get the nutrients get satiety then 
you lose the cravings, you lose the addiction. We're all talking about addiction, but if you know you're freed from addiction once your body gets the nutrients it needs from the food you eat. All right, uh, I would love to get into also uh, some other mistakes that are uh, or, or stuff you don't believe in. Um, what's out there today that people are talking about that you don't think makes a lot of sense? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we covered all of the ones from the book. Um, I suppose interesting. What about something that uh, there's a, it's a lot of talk about oxalates? They are supposedly <laughs> the big problem in the world today. Or yeah, I, I suppose there's a lot of fear of of different things, whether it be cholesterol, saturated fat, or oxalates, or plant based foods, animal based foods, and you know, um, a lot of the time we one side paints the other side as the bad guy and i think some people when it comes to oxalates some people definitely don't tolerate them well i'm not an extreme expert on the area but my understanding is that the majority of the oxalates produced in your body are produced by your body not from your diet the diet only contributes a little bit and if you're getting a good blend of minerals particularly calcium if your calcium oxalate ratio is high enough your kidney just clears the oxalates quite easily and Definitely, um, you shouldn't be living on uh, uh, almond nut flour, everything, and and spinach smoothies. That's probably not a great nutritious way to eat anyway. But um, if you're getting a blend of foods, you don't need to fear. You know, nobody's dying of obesity from the three leaves of spinach. That you know, the spinach isn't the the worst thing in the world to be eating. And everybody, f any time I share something online about green stuff everybody reacts and goes what about the oxalates they're going to kill you and it's like ah, you know those foods also contain a lot of beneficial nutrients that we so no no need to be overly yeah. uh overly scared about uh catching especially if you're getting minerals a, a good amount of calcium in your diet particularly hmm. so how about this uh this thing of uh um, having a continuous glucose monitor and avoiding glucose spikes <laughs> such yeah, as yeah. you get from eating blueberries i've, I've heard <laughs> companies selling these uh devices that uh yeah try no, to scare that, people away from eating these terrible blueberries that spike your glucose what do you think yeah if you're eating pizza your, your glucose is going to go up and then come crashing down and you're going to be hungry again later but you know if you're insulin sensitive if you're not obese then uh, a moderate glucose rise and fall back down is going to be perfectly fine some fluctuation in glucose is is just part of normal appetite signaling um, in our challenges we recommend people dial back their carbs if they're seeing a, a rise of more than 30 milligrams per deciliter or 1.6 millimole because a lot of the time you uh, your blood sugar falls back down and you you're driven to eat again sooner but a lot of the time those foods are the the junk food that we know we should avoid anyway um but the risk comes when you avoid all carbs and switch it for fat or even worse still you know glucose goddess talks about clothing your carbs with fat so you're adding fat to carbs to blunt your glucose response and that just makes ultra processed you know uh, hyper palatable food it's it's the fat and carb combo again that drives us to eat more so all these people are believing that because i've got a flat line glucose that that's again a free food potentially it's the same keto myth yeah, same. perpetuated and and driven a lot of the time because people are making a ton of money out of selling cgms yeah anything else like that you want to bring up ah oh, no nothing nothing particularly not, not really. it's been a fun so, chat Let's just uh, move on uh, uh, before we wrap up. Move on to the future. What kind of future do you see here? Like, what's uh, what's your goal? What are your plans? Uh, how do we make the world a better place? Like, we we have this huge, uh, obviously, epidemic of poor metabolic mm. health and obesity in the world, driving our top chronic diseases, mostly caused by the food we eat. So, mm. how do we um, contribute to making that problem smaller? Do you think? Yeah, I, I think people focusing on the foods that provide satiety and the nutrients they need if enough people are empowered to understand that and given the tools like the 
the Harbour app that'll just make it super simple for them to implement, then that'll that'll catch on and be beneficial. And I'm just passionate about giving the people who want to make a change, um, giving them that opportunity to make that change and be informed and, and have a, a simple tool to do that. So I'm really excited to see what you guys are doing with the Harbour app to make that really accessible to more and more people and just easy to implement. Well, I look forward to collaborating with you on that. And of course, uh, if people want to, want to check you out, they can go to your website, uh, optimizingnutrition.com, right? Yep. Yeah, we're optimizing nutrition I'm everywhere. And we've got the Data Driven Fasting Challenge and a Macros Masterclass where we talk about satiety. And then for the nerds that want to make sure they're getting all the micros from their food, we've got a Micros Masterclass as well. Yeah, I think uh, uh, for anybody listening, if you really want to optimize your nutrition, if you're a little bit on the geeky side when it comes to data and uh, and looking at numbers, then uh, Mark is your man and you should check him out. Thanks. But uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for your friendship, Andreas. It's great to work with you. I love what you're doing. Likewise. Talk to you soon.